What is up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of Talk of the Tundra, your Green Bay Packers podcast, a proud partner of the Eurostep Podcast Network and the Blue Wire family. As always, I am your host, Numak, uh, coming to you with another Packers podcast this week with the preview of the Vikings game. And to, to break it down, as always, is my lovely co-host, Jordan Tresky. Jordan, how are you doing, buddy? Doing well, doing well. Time to talk some Packers, and we got a lot to talk about. Unfortunately, it's not a lot of good stuff. <laughs> no, not a, lot, not a lot of good to be had. Um, but before we get into the pack or into the Vikings game, my apologies. Um, we have to go over the cheeses from Sunday's disappointing 1917 loss to the Denver Broncos. Um, while it was a albeit bad outing from most of the team. We got to give out some cheeses, some cheeses for the top performers, even though it may have seemed like there weren't a lot of them. But first and foremost is AJ Dillon, uh, 15 carries for 61 yards and two catches for 34 yards. Without a doubt, his um his best game of the season. I know you're rubbing your eyes, but what? Why are you rubbing your face for? I'm I'm doing that because I thought you were gonna be like the team's leading receiver. <laughs> the team's leading receiver. <laughs> um. By yardage, he had two catches, but Luke Musgrave had four catches for 30 yards. So, but again, all around uh, 95 yards on the day. Not too bad for a guy we had been railing against just to get it going um, earlier in the season. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, he, he showed up. He did show up. He it, it was nice to see him finally do so because other than that, it had been kind of tough sledding for him pretty much all year. But the calendar turned to October, and for some reason, that really matters in AJ Dillon's mind as a how to be a good back. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, second up on the list for cheese is uh, right tackle Zach Tom. He had an offensive uh, grade on PFF, PFF of eighty point three, the highest rated Packer on offense, I think, and defense. Correct, if I'm not mistaken. Um, I think that is correct. Uh, At no. least in terms of like our, featured players, our our third um, our third cheese recipient was the highest one. Um, Zach Tom was the third highest rated, but first on offense. Yes. So, um, in total, just had a a really good, um, just a really good first. I should say first game because he's been playing a couple of games now. Just a really good game. And I don't think Jordan Love got sacked at all, if I'm not mistaken. You can correct me if I'm nope. wrong on that, but um it looks like just continuing to be a solid piece of that uh of that offense. And had a couple of snaps at center too. Yeah, when Josh Myers went down, which hopefully we don't have to worry about any longer. <laughs> which we'll talk about um in a little bit when it comes to the injury report for the for the Vikings game. But yeah, Zach Tom, I apologize. I got his number wrong. I was on the week, but not the I was on I was on the annual uh ratings, uh, not the week. He still is the top rated player on um offense and is still the third player in defense or in overall. Uh, but this week his offensive uh rating was 84.1. So big uh big hype there, as well as just general um pass blocking he had. No penalties. He had four snaps at center. Uh, the rest of his six year at right tackle, obviously, but no, uh, no pressures allowed, which meant no, um, no Jordan Jordan Love sacks. Notably, mm-hmm. uh, Elton Jenkins had two pressures, which isn't ideal. <laughs> yeah, and a penalty. No penalties for Tom too. Yep. Um, looks like yeah, Myers and um. Excuse me, Elton Jenkins were the only two players um, on the line with the penalties. Third and final cheese goes to our weekly candidate, always up for one, Rashawn Gary. Um, continued to to play well. Uh, one QB hit, three tackles, two of them being solo. Um, but he is he was the second highest rated uh, defensive player on the defensive side, just behind Kingsley and Enig- Barre. But Enig Barre had quite a few uh fewer snaps than than uh, gary did gary had six total pressures with one hit and five hurries and uh only one missed tackle and credited with one stop which is pff's own metric so he continues to develop i think i saw something earlier this week that he was leading the 
the league, I think, in like pressure percentage. If I'm not mistaken, that's what that what that was. So he's still being good. He still has to get home a little more often to break that break into that upper echelon of pass rushers in the NFL, kind of like Max Crosby, the Bolsa brothers, and the rest of them. But he's he's getting there, and I think there is an opportunity for him to to reach that 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 echelon. Most snaps on the season with 40. The highest amount of pressures in a game this year was six, which is kind of surprising because he has, you know, generated a lot of pressure, but sacks are obviously the biggest uh, thing missing with him, or at least in volume, more higher volume. But yeah, um, he did a really good job of trying to get to Wilson, even if he didn't necessarily get home to him. Right, exactly. Exactly. And sacks are the name of the game. Like if you can get sacks, that's probably the worst thing you can do or the best thing you can do as a defensive player besides forcing a turnover. But sacks put them back in yardage and it just is so important to put the offense in those detrimental positions that once they are back, the percentage of getting a first down just plummets. So that is just the next step of his game. He really needs to to hone in is just getting home that one extra step or one extra second earlier. Yeah. So you get those sacks. So I think that's all I want to talk about the Denver game. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. <laughs> Perfect. Let's move on to the, uh, the Vikings game. We can go through their injury report and some tweets from uh, leading into the week or no, we got some news and news and notes first. Got a lot. Um, yeah. Some roster moves that are, depressing so maybe i do want to talk about broncos more no just kidding <laughs> um coming out of the broncos game darnell savage uh injured his calf again and eric stokes uh injured his hamstring both of which are going to the ir designated to return later this year uh darnell savages was on um a no was a no contact injury at the start of a play he tried to accelerate to run and subsequently didn't his calf gave out on him. Good to hear it's not a uh, Achilles when it comes to something like that, considering calf injuries are usually precursors to more serious Achilles injuries should you bring them back too soon. So at least he's designated to come back in at least four weeks and not out the rest of the season. Um, Eric Stokes getting hurt on special teams is a questionable decision by the entire coaching staff. I'm not sure what you think about it, but... To, to bring a guy back who had missed almost all of the year or the second half of last year and then had multiple injuries to his legs to then throw him in a spot where he needs to run full bore down the field. Maybe not the best decision by the coaching staff and the strength and conditioning people. I concur. <laughs> I don't, I, I, yeah, that, um, it was a likely outcome and we have unfortunately reached that outcome. Yeah, it's just, it was frankly stupid. It's really all there is to it, honestly. Yeah. Um. Additionally, as corresponding moves, the Packers signed uh, cornerback Corey Ballantyne from their practice squad and signed quarterback Robert Rochelle to their 53-man roster. I believe Rochelle was a former former Ram, if I'm not mistaken. The correct. Right? Super Bowl right. champion. Love to hear it. A little Super Bowl flavor for this Packers team. Cool. Super awesome. <laughs> um, exactly what we need is, is some Super Bowl pedigree players. The only Super Bowl that they'll be talking about this uh, this year. Right. Um, I know there are some people on Packers Twitter that were uh, enamored with him coming out of uh, the draft in 2021. That's possibly a, rate, a late round target. Um, if I'm not mistaken, his ARIA score is through the roof for um, as, a quarter, as a cornerback. If I can figure out uh, if RS would load, I'd tell you sooner, but I'm pretty I got sure it. you I have got it up. It. Thank you. Yeah. 9.65 RAS, fourth rounder in 2021, Central Arkansas. Um, Yeah, he ranked 63rd out of uh, 1,784 quarter, cornerbacks from 1987 to 2021. Um, Pretty good. Pretty I'd good. Say pretty good. <laughs> um, he fast, 441. Um, on on his 40 just has a really good um, athletic, just an athletic guy, which is basically, again, the Goody way 
and uh, mainly a, a special teamer from what I've been seeing in the talk about him. So it makes sense that they'd, they'd sign him to replace two of their secondary players. So that secondary gets thinner with starters, but maybe there's a chance that we find a, a quality starter when it comes to when it comes to uh, finding striking gold with Robert Rochelle. Are going to find another uh, Razul Douglas? Just maybe. That'd be cool. <laughs> That'd be cool. Um, let's see. A couple other things in Rochelle. Um, had five starts, had one interception and one fumble recovery. Um, they spent time on the Seahawks and Panthers practice squads before coming here. So, um, one last thing is that to replace uh, Ballantyne on the practice squad, they signed uh, cornerback Zion Gilbert to the practice squad, and that was that was it for uh, news and notes. I should say a sad news and notes section. That's for sure. Yeah, it's going to get sadder. Oh boy. <laughs> um, let's go through some injury report stuff. Not that I really want to go through this, but because it. Again, I think you're right that it's getting sadder. Um, Jair Alexander, this is recording this on a Wednesday, so I have Thursday or Thursday's um, time as they usually would. But Jair Alexander was limited with his back injury on Wednesday. Safety Zane Anderson was a full participant. He might need to suit up this week to actually play, considering Darnell Savage is out. Um, Devondre was limited. Uh, e- EG was limited. Uh, Aaron Jones, Luke Musgrave, and Josh Myers all were. Uh, did not participate. Matt LaFleur said of Aaron Jones that he uh, is a little bit sore, but they will ramp him up, which is like, he shouldn't be sore, dude. He shouldn't be sore. If he has an opportunity to be sore, he shouldn't have fucking played. Like, it's just, it, it's just so simple. It's just simple. And yet here we are. I feel like we're in like this like the Packers are playing like operation. <laughs> you know I, mean? I do know what you mean. I do and they're like mean. trying to figure it out. I was like, damn, this hamstring really hurts. Let's ramp them up. Let's ramp them up. <laughs> yeah, that was just a that when I saw that quote, I was like, those two two things do not go together. Those no, are they, not, sh- they sure those don't. Are incongruent thoughts don't bring math into this two plus two equals five it's, apparently it does <laughs> this <laughs> backwards world <laughs> so um a couple more injuries to I, I know you wanted to hear about them listener i know you did um <laughs> yash nyman limited with a knee injury christian watson was a full participant with his knee injury and Devonte wyatt was a limited participant with a knee injury so anything below the like the pecs below the belt <laughs> No, well, we got Jair's back, so we have a little bit, a oh, little yeah. bit of torso in there. But yeah, anything below <laughs> below the pecs, dog shit for the Packers right now. Um, for the Vikings, notably T.J. Hawkinson, um, their star tight end, it was a DMP with a foot injury, but they did not, but they did not hold an official practice on um, Wednesday as they played Monday night against the Niners and had one, so off day for them estimation of what they would have been so um linebacker brian Azamoa uh, with a dmp with an ankle injury um their guard ezra cleveland was a limited participant with a foot injury and um they have a wide receiver who i've never heard of jalen naylor notably not jalen rager rager yeah not not him um was a limited participant with a hamstring injury but he is currently um in his window to return from IR similarly as Eric Stokes was last year or last week. My apologies. So um, the Vikings injury report is significantly shorter than the Packers, which isn't good. One team, one team's injury report reflects a team that might be on the rise and the other team reflects a team that might be on a slide. Continuing their slide. They're, yeah, they're... continue the slide. Wee! Wee! <laughs> Let's see how far this goes. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, I'm trying to see here. Um, Christian Watson came coming out of uh, the practice on Wednesday. Said, "Quote: um, Me personally, I was definitely a little scared there. Definitely don't want to deal with anything knee wise. Don't want to deal with any injuries in the moment. It was definitely pretty scary. Initial plan or the initial pain, the initial shock of it. Obviously, the situation as well. Um, 
being on there two minutes, I wasn't doing anything. I could get up and get off the field. So we didn't have to bump, we didn't have to burn a timeout or get a 10 second runoff. I just couldn't get up, uh, couldn't get up quick enough. All that matters is I'm good now. So I'll just go from there. Good to know that it's not causing him any more pain than initially he had on Sunday because Lord knows bubble no, boy needs to be healthy. <laughs> also, we did not hit on the fact that Luke Musgrave, who got uh, obliterated. obliterated, Kareem Jackson was initially suspended for four games that has been reduced to two games, but he has been a repeat offender of aggressive hits and everything like that. Luke Musgrave did not get hurt on that play or uh, have a recurrence of his concussion protocol. He injured his ankle. Which is crazy. Crazy. <laughs> crazy. Totally crazy. Because like so he just got goes, rocked. Yeah. That kind of goes to show uh where the Packers injuries are at. And just like if it's not that, oh it'll be this thing. Yeah, it's nothing is going right for the Packers right now. Like I think no. that's just the, the theme I, of the season. I is think is our that, tone reflects that. <laughs> yeah, our tone reflects that as well as just uh, in general it's pretty obvious that everything that, that can go wrong with the Packers right now is, is going wrong. Yes. 100%. S- save for a couple of injury, like grateful non injuries to Christian Watson and Devonte Wyatt, who is, who is limited, but still you get my point. It's just, it's not going well right now. It's not going yeah. well. So should we hop into the matchup? Talk about the actual football, the actual football of it all. Yes. Let's, let's do it. The Packers lead the series with the Vikings 64 to 56 in three ties all time. Um, Minnesota enters week eight, three and four, having won their last two games um, against Chicago and San Fran two opposite ends of the spectrum talent wise, but they beat them both <laughs> nonetheless. Um, meanwhile, the Packers have obviously dropped three in a row um, to the Lions, Raiders and Broncos. The Broncos and Raiders being again, you know, this already a significantly worse team than we had anticipated to losing against. Um, the Packers and Vikings both split the, their home games last year. Packers went home, Vikings went at home. And blowouts in pretty much both games. Like Neither game was, was that close to where it was any sort of exciting to watch. Um, competitively, I should say. So, coming into the, the season... The Vikings were again playoff hopefuls in a way that they thought they could continue on their momentum last year, having gone. Correct me if I'm wrong, Jordan. I believe it was four. thirteen and four. Yeah, and didn't resign Kirk Cousins. Or should I say, didn't sign Kirk Cousins to an extension. Um, went in, and went out and got Jordan Addison in the in the draft. They extended uh, T.J. Hawkinson um, late in the summer, if not if not mistaken. It wasn't like you'd be correct, yep. right? So. They're coming in hoping to build off of that momentum. And to start the season, it wasn't really showcasing stuff. I believe they were 0 3 at one point um, or 0 2. They had started pretty slow. I'm going to double check my math here before I go talking about stuff, but I'm pretty sure they started pretty slow. 0 3. They lost to the Buccaneers, the Eagles, and the Chargers um, in weeks one through three. And then as I mentioned, wins against the Bears and the 49ers, lost to the Chiefs, but then have uh, they beat the Panthers as well. So still have a hard schedule ahead of them as they were finished first um, in the division last year, but nothing too difficult. I think their hardest opponent left currently would be the Bengals. Otherwise, the Falcons, the Saints, and the Broncos, they still have to face as well. The point being that the Vikings are in a much better place right now, and they're kind of trending towards what they ought to what they really thought they were going to be. And that has come significantly on significantly on the, the heels of their, their passing game. The, the passing game success has continued from last year when Justin Jefferson really broke out on this, not that he didn't break out in years prior, but he had a, a career year last year and having lost Delvin cook in the offseason and trying to go ahead with Alexander Madison, they've really kind of gone away from the run game. They, they got back into it a little bit on Monday with cam Akers and sort of how he has had a resurgence the more he's gotten acclimated in Minnesota since leaving uh, Los Angeles. But it really is this this air raid offense that Minnesota has that has really given them a whole lot of success 
with Justin Jefferson before he went down um, on IR with a, I believe a hamstring injury. Mm -hmm. But now with Jordan Addison too, as their rookie, like he's been showing out pretty well. And I know you're a big fan of him as well. Having him on your fantasy team. Yes. He's uh, (laughs) sorry, John, uh, but he helped me (laughs) beat you. (laughs) (laughs) So um, entering week eight, uh, the Vikings have the third most passing yards in the NFL behind Miami and Kansas City, which is, I guess, I would say surprising, Jordan. I'm not sure if you would agree with that, but given that Miami's had like this high powered, just absolute jet fuel offense, then then Patrick Mahomes is the Kansas City part of that. To see Kirk Cousins leading the NFL with 16 touchdowns um, and attempting the most passes per game is incredible and how their offense has sort of developed around Cousins, Jefferson, and now Addison. Yeah, I mean, for me, seeing this and having watched some Vikings games just because, you know, they're in the area and the Packers aren't playing, you're either going to get a Vikings game or a Bears game. Maybe a Lions game, but it's not as frequent as the other two. Um, But seeing the Vikings play as well as they have, and obviously a lot of the early games that they slipped or lost, Um, having to come back, you're going to be passing more. You're going to be looking for quick scores. Their pass to play ratio, as you, uh, kind of led on, they have, they have, uh, 68.76% of their plays are passing plays. 31.2% of their plays are rushes. That is like... Both they they pass the ball more than anybody else, and they run the ball the least out of anybody. So yeah, they have really gotten all in. Um, obviously, I think a lot of Packers fans a couple of weeks ago when they saw that Justin Jefferson was down, were at least when he went on IR, they were looking at that as a bullet dodged. I don't think that is necessarily the case. Of course, Justin Jefferson is very good, but there's a reason why you go out and get C.J. Hawkinson and then extend them because you're going to need them when you don't have Justin Jefferson, Jordan exactly. Addison, Jordan Addison has hit the ground running clearly. Um, KJ Osborne is not even that like bad of a slack guy normally, but obviously elevated to like a second option. And we know what damage that uh, Alexander Madison can do, you know, whether it's screen passes behind the line scrimmage plays, that kind of thing where they just have the talent and <laughs> There are a lot of problems historically with the Vikings and why they haven't gotten the big one, but they draft wide receivers like crazy. And Kirk Cousins, for all his foibles, and he's not the perfect quarterback, but the guy, if Jordan Love showed anything near what Kirk Cousins was, is doing right now, we'd be in a lot different position than we are right now. Oh, absolutely. And I think like TJ Hawkinson has been a huge difference maker for them. Like, not to say that TJ Hawkinson was just some guy last year or was just some guy on the um on the Lions, but he's he's just doing so well this year and providing that extra edge that they needed over the middle for that passing game. Like he's a legitimate threat. I think it's something that is going to be a problem for the Packers this week, given that they're gonna have to stick Quay on him or stick one of the rookie uh cornerbacks if Jair is out or anybody on him. Like he's he's a he's a big dude. He's Six five two fifty, yeah. Like we don't have, you have to have Razul on him to to really match up anywhere close at Razul at six two, and so with that being um being said, it's just it'll be a tough matchup for sure to match up with both Addison at his speed as well as Hawkinson to just pure size, and he's been a featured part of the offense. He has forty seven receptions for almost four hundred yards this year, like that's. That's a lot. Like I, mm-hmm. I, I don't think there's um, too many, too many uh, tight ends ahead of him that are uh, leading him in in reception, receiving yards. I'm trying to to pull it up quick just to get the uh, the tight ends, but uh, I'm having trouble really pulling it up before I before I miss it. Only uh, Travis Kelsey. That's it. I was I saw that he was leading tight ends, but I couldn't figure out. Um, who else would and be only, around there? Only uh, Kelsey and targets too. Really? And receptions. That, that, <laughs> that makes that makes sense. Yeah, consistently. 
and it's not even, I guess, well, 125 yards is a lot more than, than the 400 that Hawkinson has, but right. When you're second to the best tight end in the league, it's a good, a good uh, barometer of how your season's going. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Um, thankfully, we won't have to worry about the Justin Jefferson at all with him being on IR. Like him being out sucks for football reasons. But I think if <laughs> if they have to deal if they had to deal with Jefferson, Addison, and Hawkinson all together, I think this game would have been would be not close. But alas. We thankfully don't have to deal with Justin Jefferson. We will later in the year, but not right now. Yeah. Yeah. Especially with where the Packers secondary stands right now. Right. With Stokes being out after logging four snaps um, and Jair being limited again today. Um, Carrington Val- Valentine and Corey Valentine are probably going to have to step up. Um, the Carrington Valentine issue is a bad one. He got picked on a lot on yes. Sunday from Russell Wilson. Uh Seven targets, six completions, and for 89 yards. Um, for what it's worth, Razul Douglas allowed 29 yards on passes thrown his way on Sunday, which is second most on defense. So they didn't throw the ball a whole lot, but when they did, they were throwing it at Carrington Valentine. Not good. No, it's not ideal, frankly. No. And honestly, I mean, that's what you're a seventh round rookie cornerback. You're going to get highlighted on and picked on. Yeah, that it just, happens. Yeah, it's not like a testament to his skill. He's a seventh round rookie. He has he needs time to develop, and it's it shows. Yes, one hundred percent. Which is to say, he won't be good at some point in his career. It's just you can't really blame the guy no. getting thrown in uh, to that. So, um, the biggest part I think in stopping this air attack. I think is going to be the pass rush because the secondary is going to need help. And I think that help is going to need to come from Rashawn Gary, Preston Smith, Kenny Clark. Like those three need to wreak havoc on that Vikings offensive line, which has been better than it was this year. Um, having allowed only uh, having a sack percentage before I get to for my sentence, a sack percentage of 5.1%, which is good for six um, in the NFL. Notably, right behind the Packers who are at fifth. So another, another stat. I saw this and did not put it on our little prep list. The only offensive lineman in the NFL this season to play 100% or sorry, 100 plus pass protection snaps without allowing a pressure is Viking center Garrett Bradbury. Pretty impressive. Who Kenny Clark has notably in the past eaten alive. Yes. We'll see how that fares this year and if he's improved in his protection and be able to stop Kenny Clark or if Kenny Clark continues to sort of eat his lunch. Yeah. Which you'll need to do because I don't know how else you stop this passing attack with this Packers secondary right now. They're, they just have no. the, the pressures just have to get there. Like if there's a time I set it up top talking about Jesus. If there's a time for Rashawn Gary to start picking up his pressure rate to becoming sack rate then this is this is the week to do it if they really want to get go out and get the win. Um we said it all week last week. We're gonna keep saying it for the rest of the weeks um during the season. It's not about wins and losses anymore. It's about development. And for as much as Rashawn Gary isn't a developing player or we don't think of him as a developing developing player, he is a developing developing player coming off of an ACL injury. And so seeing real progress from him and actually getting home to the quarterback and making use of that pressure rate is part of his development as an edge rusher. And getting to that upper echelon of of pass rushers, and this is the week to do it. Like it, there's just no ifs, ands, or buts about it. And seeing if um, JJ Enigbare can can come through and and get it, get a sack when he comes in at times for uh, Rashawn Gary, Preston Smith being the veteran that he is should be a leader to try and get there. It, it's it, I think it really stinks if Jair is out again because having Jair out. And Savage out, and now it's like Stokes out, even though he didn't really play into the the defensive scheme in the first place. We we haven't really seen a lot of the creative blitzes from Joe Barry as of late. Like I remember early in the season, we were seeing corner blitzes, safety blitzes from Jair, right? Stunts, all this kind of stuff, where it was mixing up looks for 
the offensive line and the protection to get home to the quarterback. There hasn't really been a lot of that as the last couple of weeks. And maybe that's part of the reason they're not getting home as often, but um, it, it it is a problem that I think they should get back into doing. Cause if you're not going to create those interesting looks, or I don't want to say, I don't want to say create creative looks cause that sounds redundant, but if they're not developing creative looks for the, offense to to read pre-snap then all you're doing is just rushing five every time and that's the same manner the same the same the same the same and they're not getting home um they had 15 pressures against Denver and got home once like that's not a good that's not a good uh conversion ratio for pressures to sacks it just isn't and so they need to get the sacks I'm not saying they need six seven sacks a game but they need to get at least four I think like for how often they're they're pressuring, right? Like to to ask for a thirty three percent sack rate is that is that something to behold? Is it so hard? Right. I, I mean, is it? <laughs> Go on. Yeah, I mean that that is the defense. That is ultimately the biggest swing factor in this. And that Vikings O line has historically, at least when the Packers have played them, have really struggled against the Packers p- pass rush. We usually think about it. Think about it in terms of, you know, the edge rushers, whether it's like Zadarius Smith, Preston Smith, now Rashawn Gary. Kenny Clark has done historically really well against Vikings. Um, and as, as you know, impressive as they have been this year, Kirk Cousins has seven fumbles. Uh-huh. The Vikings have the third most giveaways with 14 in the NFL. It shows that and the other and the other element in this, whereas we looked at last week where Packers, you know, saw the same pass rushes uh snap after snap. And once you break contain and you just find a hole up the middle of the field, Russell Wilson's gonna get chunk plays. Kirk Cousins can make those plays. I'm not saying he's gonna make them to the degree that Russell Wilson can, but he also is as um has a proclivity to lose the football when he's pressured. Mm-hmm. So yeah, that that is going to be the game is just can the Packers get home? They have their coverage issues whether that is with Jair or without because they just have so many injuries across their secondary. And yeah, just being able to wreak havoc on in the trenches on the offensive line or last game sorry. That's going to be the ball game. Really? Right. Um, Going back to sack percentage, Packers have the 14th best sack percentage in the league at 7.73. Almost a half a percent or a full percent. I'm sorry, a full half percent um, behind Arizona at 13, who's at 8.23. Cleveland Cleveland leads the way at almost 11% for what it's worth. Um, For sacks per game, the Packers are 15th, which is about in line with their sack percent um, yeah. at 2.7 a game. So me asking for three isn't this this huge ask from, from the team. Like They should just be getting home more often. And I think an interesting point when you bring up um, Kirk Cousins as turnover, turnovers and all of his fumbles, the, the same reasons why we thought the Vikings were frauds last year was all of their wins in close games. This year, it's the same thing, but the opposite. The Vikings have played all of their games super closely. They lost to uh, the Buccaneers by three. They lost to the Eagles by six. They lost to the Chargers by four. Won over the Panthers by eight. uh, Lost to the Chiefs by by seven. Beat the Bears by six. Beat the Niners by five. And I think a lot of those early losses were were because of Kirk Cousins' turnovers. A lot of fumbles, mm-hmm. a lot of untimely interceptions. And so I think this team is going to be set up for a pretty good stretch run here going against the Packers, the Falcons, the Saints, the Broncos, the Bears, the Raiders, the Bengals, the Lions, Packers, the Lions. Like we could see the Lions end up similarly to how they ended up last year, but with a more consistent, um, I guess a more reliable process to get there, if that makes sense. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, last year it was high flying. 
high variance when it comes to winning games that they won. But if you think about how their offense looks right now, if Kirk Cousins can stop making the mistakes and protect the ball better on fumbles, like purely fumbles, I think they're they're set up pretty well. Yeah. Yeah, those are, I mean, I'm sure that played a part in why they went 0-3 to start the year, but the more that they protect them, you know, shocker, the better right. they do. <laughs> right, exactly. And so I think like the one way to to really get this uh, Vikings offense to slow down is to make them run. Like they 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 picked up, actually they picked up, they decided to go with Alexander Madison as their lead back this this season cutting ties with Delvin Cook and frankly like he's not been producing as as much as you think that he would go ahead Jordan are you ready for this step I am ready for the step the Minnesota Vikings are the only team in the NFL that has not scored a rushing touchdown wow that's incredible that's weird it is. It's really weird. <laughs> and it's so weird. And it, and I know most people don't really care about fantasy, but it kind of like colors my uh, my thought as to how I flop on Alexander Madison in the past, as well as how a lot of other people did. And so that is that when Dalvin Cook predictably would go out with an injury um, over his past few years, half the reason why they the Vikings end up cutting ties with them is that when he was out, Alexander Madison would replace him over the course of the rest of the season or game to game and would do very well. He would have a do a pretty good job of filling in and putting up good numbers, which is why the decision to move to Alexander Madison after Dalvin Cook made sense. He's cheaper, he's younger, hasn't been hurt as much. And now it just hasn't been there. Um, averaging four yards a carry, which isn't bad. His longest yard of uh, the longest run of the season is only 19 yards, um, averaging 50 yards a game, and he's got a fumble on the season. And so I think it's part of like the early 10s Packers where their passing game is so good. Why do they want yes. to run the ball? Yep. But at the same time, I think them running the ball would benefit them a little better. So is it Alexander Madison being a less than average running back or are they just choosing to really take advantage of their passing game which i could see both options being realistic yeah i mean it's a fair discussion to have because it's not that he's a bad running back or anything like that i think they viewed this balance of okay we have a very talented running back but he obviously piled up injuries um and Delvin Cook, they move on from him. And then it's like, okay, we're gonna we're just gonna do the air raid. We're gonna keep just throwing the ball down our opponents' throats. We had the wide receiver core to and tight end to do so. Mm-hmm. What's the harm in doing that? Just keep doing that. And obviously, again, game script plays a part in the aforementioned, you know, pass to run play ratio. But I also just think it's by design. I mean, Madison is a very, he can be dangerous. He has utility, not just, you know, as a traditional running back, if you want to call it that, but he is sort of a safety valve in that he can make plays on screens, that kind of thing. I think the the thing for me is that they made the trade for Cam Akers, I believe even just after week the first three. couple of weeks. After, after week, week three. three. And... I understand why they do that guy wanted a fresh start that weird situation with him and the Rams the last couple of years, of course, just let's take a gamble on the talent and it hasn't really popped there. They really have honed in on Madison being the lead guy. And to your point, I think that's where you see kind of the danger in, well, this guy did it for spells. Let's do it, you know, as the lead guy. And you know, <laughs> we're seeing it with AJ Dillon. Like it's they're completely different uh kind of running backs in general. But when you take away this kind of strong link player like that, who you think like, oh yeah, he's very replaceable considering you know all the factors that are played into that, it's not so easy when you know time comes and you're relying on him to kind of 
uh, I guess, establish the run game and whether it's on him or it's the run blocking or teams that they're playing against too, like it just hasn't worked so far to the degree that I would imagine that they're hoping it would have. Right. Exactly. And I think that's where like the, the Packers just, they have to figure out how to stop the run and making sure that when they're running, they're getting nothing out of it. Like the, yeah. as we've talked about in the past, the Packers are, are not a good rushing defense. They did fine against the Raiders. They did not do fine against the, the Broncos. If they can really making make sure that the Vikings are passing and like are in predictable passing situations, they should have the opportunity to to make some stops in this game and hopefully keep it close. But yeah. if they're if they're letting Alexander Madison run up the middle or if the running camp makers catch out in the flat and have big gains in like the passing game that way where it's pitches or short throws like that, then that this has an opportunity for for it to really get away from the Packers. Yeah. And it, it really is just that simple because when when you think about the rush defense of it all, like the hopefully, hopefully the the interior defensive line can start stuffing holes. They haven't been the best at it, but I think that's where that development needs to come from from some of the young guys like Devontae Wyatt and I'm, I'm Kenny Clark is the best player on that line and he needs to be in there. But at some point, I just want to kind of see, like, maybe go jumbo linemen and see if get some of the young guys in there, get Colby uh, Brooks in there, or get Carl Brooks in there and Colby Wooden in there, and see if they can stop a run and make a play, getting a sack or something. Give them a different look than Clark, Wyatt, Preston, and Gary. It's really that simple. Yeah. And I think that's part of like what I want to see. I want to see different things mixed up. I think at one point against the Falcons, we saw like six defensive linemen throw that in there a couple of times, see how it works. And if they can do that, there's opportunity for the Packers to beat the Vikings here. It's like just from a defensive side of the ball. Frankly, it's, it's at Lambeau. It's the first time the Packers went home in almost a month. It's, it, it's an opportunity for them to, not hit the reset button in the season and make a push because I think that's out of the realm of possibilities given what we've seen from this offense as of late. But I think it's it's an opportunity for the development to be kickstarted to building towards something bigger. Because if they can get a win and have everyone play like good fundamental football, that's stuff you can build on going forward. Yeah, because we're going to be focused in on how can they stop the pass, how can they just cover Jordan Addison, Hawkinson, goes on down the line. We could easily be talking about this game Sunday evening and the Packers let up 200 rushing yards because they have shown that Mm -hmm. even against lesser or better talent, obviously. But Alexander Alexander Madison has gassed his defense up before. Yeah. I wouldn't be surprised if he does it again. Yeah. And, like, I know Cam Akers hasn't been good, but he's been – they've been working him in – um, more as of late, um, 30 uh, yards on 10 carries on Monday to go with two catches of 30 yards. So he has, he has most like involvement in the um, in the game against San Francisco. So we'll see. I just think it's again. Yeah, if we could be talking about a big game of the rushing attack, at which point if we lose to their rushing game, I'm going to be very upset because like, yeah. It's just the rope a dope. Yeah, it'd be disappointing that like Mm -hmm. they're not a good rushing team, but they know the weaknesses the Packers had and just exploited them to a T, which would bring back the Joe Barry discussion of it all. But again, Joe Barry, I think, has been doing fine this year, been doing better than the offense. I can't rag on him that much, but I'd still be disappointed regardless. So let's move on to the um, to the offensive offensive side of the ball. It's it's like the. We put it off. It's it's fine. We put it off it's for the, you know, the uh, bad vibes of it all. <laughs> um, George, it starts with Jordan Love. I think that's pretty obvious. It's football. It all starts with the quarterback. But he has had his worst stretch of football, obviously, of his football career. These last three losses uh, started off really hot. I think he had something like six touchdowns to no interceptions to the first three games. It is now has like, I think two 
touchdowns to like seven interceptions or something like that. It's not good. It's not good to say the least. No. Um, he's he faces the most aggressive defenses in the league. In his first matchup with the Vikings, their Vikings defense has been totally, totally, um, reinvigorated after last year. They just they're just better than they were last year. Um, Vikings blitz fifty percent of the time, which is best in the league. That they are blitzing more than anybody, which is impressive considering the Packers run a three four defense and their regular blitz, their regular rush is a blitz. <laughs> yeah. Good God. Um loves stats when pressured. We talked about this in the preseason. It's been a theme throughout. Um, 66 dropbacks, 42% completion rate, almost 43, um, 250 passing yards, two touchdowns, three interceptions. He just doesn't do well under pressure, which isn't entirely on him. It's also on the receivers, not being able to get open, not running routes. I think love has found a, a habit of staring down his receiver and not going through his progressions. And I think a lot of that just comes with, again, the play calling too. There, there, there was a lot of discussion on Packers Twitter this week about is it Jordan Love? Is it the receivers? Is it the play? Is it the play calling? And the simple answer is it's all of it. Like, yes, I, I saw so many videos of like, what do you do with this? What do you do with this? Like, this isn't Matt Lafleur's fault, but this isn't Jordan Love's fault. This isn't the receivers' fault. Well, right. But then if it's none of their faults, it's all of their faults. Because nothing, as we said it earlier this week, is not is working in concert with one another. No player is harmonizing with the rest of the offense to really make good plays. And so I think Matt LaFleur can call better plays that make the offense as simple as it can. At the same time, the players have to be able to execute those plays. Jordan Love has to make those throws. I believe I saw a stat earlier where this week where Jordan Love was near the top of the league in not a good way. Um, and completion percentage on or I think it was like percentage of wide open targets missed essentially. Like if, if you, yeah. if your target was wide open, how often did you miss your throw? And Jordan level was like fourth in like the teens of percents, which is not ideal. And so he just has to be better and more accurate in his passing. Like we, we kind of poo pooed the completion percentage thing at the beginning of the season. I think now it's more of a, a, a pretty decent indicator of how his season is going, frankly. Found a lot of interesting stats. I don't want to just stat dump, but we're in that conversation of just Jordan Love and what to make of it all. NFL's uh, next-gen stats uh, was very illuminating. Highest average attended air yards, Jordan Love. The highest percentage throws thrown into tight coverage. So the, the stat category is called the aggressiveness it's a very weird name for it but jordan love 25 percent of his throws so one in every four throws that he attempts he's throwing within one yard of a defender on the intended receiver not good not good so yeah like you you have that then mixed in with the vikings blitz more than anybody else in the league whether that's going to pay off in the long run or not, but just ratcheting up the pressure as much as they do. And a quarterback that is struggling right now, has been struggling in the last couple of weeks, has struggled under pressure. This offensive line ha- looked better against Denver, but has started to show cracks as, you know, as the season has gone on. Also young line too. It's, it, it, <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised if any if there's if every Packer fan is just worried about just how he's going to look because if these are not the things that are recipe for success. These are the things that combine for a recipe for disaster. And yeah, on top of all the questions about well, his supporting cast around them, Aaron Jones has been hurt, everything like that. It's it's been talked about a lot, and it's rightfully talked about. Jordan Love has not been established or put in a position to succeed around weapons that can elevate him. But he's also made bad decisions increasingly week over week. And some of that is 
<laughs> hard luck and just having to live with it. And some of it is just decision making in general. So, yeah, like you, I could not echo what you said enough of like it's everyone's fault. It doesn't matter whose fault it is. Yeah, this team is a bad team, and <laughs> the quarterback is unfortunately in a position where he has to be the you know engine to making things run Mm -hmm. and it just sputters out of control depending on the drive depending on the game depending on the opponent yeah there's been a lot of love discourse on in in the twitter sphere this this week a couple of ringer articles a couple of uh jt o'sullivan videos talking about his play like there's just been he's kind of the the main focus of quarterbacks right now because he is playing at not his best and the Packers need him to play him at his best to be to figure out what their direction is. Yeah. And it's it it's kind of a confluence of all of this stuff that is making Jordan Love a uh, pretty prime target for criticism. And he's not undeserving of it. Like I know we talked no. about him having only nine nine starts, ten starts, no, nine starts under his belt now. I think it just had the one against yeah. the Chiefs, right? Yeah. Um, eight, nine starts, whatever. A, a limited amount of starts that isn't in the double digits. But that isn't an excuse for the lack of progress in his development, right? We talked about after the Raider, after the um, the Lions game. Okay. No more games of three interceptions where they all are terribly bad. Like, just can't happen. Telegraph. Telegraph passes and just forcing the ball in the tight windows. And what have we seen since then? Telegraph passes and forcing the ball in the tight windows. Like he has an inability to complete deep shots, which they have leaned further in Mm -hmm. over the last couple of weeks. That is, I think that is what is just like almost mind boggling is that they've really, the more I thought about the Denver game and just kind of, separated myself away from just how that all ended the fact that that game was determined by this by 11 interception where samari Turi kind of does a, it's a bad ball but it's a bad route and it's yep bad decisions all around it's a bad and play it's a bad play and it's like and again we we talked about it you know after the game it's a byproduct of the fact that that drive just got killed by the uh, penalty on Elton Jenkins, mm-hmm. but they just don't have. They have gone so far away from this obvious template for how Jordan Love could be a successful quarterback in, as a first year starter. Right, and again, a lot of <laughs> there have been a lot of mitigating factors, but the results just remain, and it's just it's really hard to just see what they can install that we haven't seen over the last four weeks because they've been scoreless in the first half or haven't scored a touchdown in the first half, that's whatever the stat is, that can really stand the tide for him because this team is just so young. They they won two games this year, one in, in, in completely different fashions, mm-hmm. but they don't they still don't know how to win. And I know that's that the search for answers on that front is where it's up to Matt LaFleur and his coaching staff to do it, but it, you know, that's a, even another topic to get that we'll get into, I guess. Right. Exactly. Um, going back to your, your point talking about um, the interception and the game. Um, I watched a, a video breakdown from D- Dusty Edley uh, this week. Go check out Dusty. He's a, a good break breaker downer of, um, <laughs> I, listen, man, it, it's almost 11 o'clock. I am, <laughs> I am tired. Um, a good analyzer, analyst. My God, he's a good analyst of Packers plays and breaking down of tape of tape. Right, one of the best. And so I watched the he did an entire video on that play, and he broke down about how, uh, on that play, Toure is going off like on a, on a go route, and or I think it was a. I don't know if it was a goal route, but basically going down the field, essentially. It's kind of like a post, but yeah, yeah. Yeah. Like that kind of, yeah. He started on the the bottom side of the, on the bottom side of the screen and 
kind of wheeled out towards the sideline to go straight. No, it's not a wheel route. Regardless, I'm not this person. I'm not this person, chat. And then because of the Musgrave injury, we had Tucker Craft running a curl route over the middle. And then Jaden Reed running a um what was supposed to be a post route or go route in um over the middle of the field, supposed to draw the safety down. That is all to say. The way that Dusty explained the play to work, I I didn't necessarily agree with and how the football of it all was supposed to work and how the play was supposed to be designed to to succeed. The way he was explaining it, I understood how like what they were seeing. I just disagreed that Jaden Reed's post route is supposed to bring the deep safety in. I think there was a lot of like borderline reads that Jordan had to make that Dusty was giving him the the benefit of the doubt to, which I like, I just disagreed with. The point being is that there were so many players in one spot of the field. They had Tucker Craft over the middle, which I'm just not a fan of having Tucker Craft in the game at that point for any for purposes that we just he's a rookie, he's a blocker, he's not necessarily a pass catcher. But when when Luke Musgrave is out. It just kind of has to be what it is. I, I'm not a Josiah DeGuire fan. I would, I think I would have rather have Josiah DeGuire out there because he's a pass catcher who can do things. Like, I'm not trusting Tucker Craft to be a threat in the game. Josiah DeGuire is not either. He's a little better than Tucker Craft. You have to at least recognize him, maybe. Yeah. The post route from Jaden Reed, it didn't work. Like, it, it should have been a go. And all that is to say, this is that that is the point of the, of, what we've been talking about the last 15 minutes. It's a bad play design that put Jaden Reed's defenders closer to Samari Toure. It's a poor throw by Jordan Love to underthrow Samari Toure on that ball. And it's a poor reflection of the receiver's ability to come back to the ball. Like Toure should have fought through his defender to get back to the ball to try and fight to get a DPI, but he didn't. It just didn't work. Depending on what Jaden Reed's route was supposed to be. If he runs his actual go route versus uh, fading towards the middle, he maybe is more open than he was going over the middle. And Jordan Love shouldn't have telegraphed his pass to Samari Toure. Like, there's just so many of these things about it. I know the the big thing amongst the the listeners and me and a bunch of other fans was that hey. Paused picture video, AJ Dillon's wide open. And Dusty pushed back on that, saying, Okay, you throw to AJ Dillon, who was the fourth read in Dusty's mind on that play. He gets 10 yards and it's fourth down. In my mind, fourth He's and ten giving up the ball. <laughs> fourth and ten is better than giving up the fucking ball. Yeah. Like, say it falls incomplete. Third and fourth and twenty again. Fourth and ten you have plays for. Third and twenty, you don't. Like it's just it's just that 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 is emblematic of everything Packers offense right now. They just yeah. they get in their own way a whole lot and they just can't put it all together. And that's that's the main thing. That's just that yeah. is all it is. Like we we haven't even talked about the running backs. Like Emmanuel Wilson had a couple good runs on Sunday. He had a couple good like <laughs> He made plays? He made plays. Like I I, I was I had a shred of hope, Jordan. Like I'm, I'm serious. A shred of hope that at the end of the first half on on Sunday, I'm I'm speeding to the play by play right now, so I can go. I can go look at it. Um, first and ten, Green Bay twenty five. Five seconds left to go. Shotgun snap, Manuel Wilson off the right guard for fourteen yards. I was like, Which I believe was the most yards they had to play that half. Probably. But then my my I kind of, my eyes kind of lit up. I was like, hmm. Maybe that's the start of us. Maybe that's a spark. Maybe. Maybe it's the defense being letting like letting up the easy stuff to get to the halftime. Probably what it was. But when your longest rush was 15 yards from AJ Dillon. Like, and that came in the second half. It's just, why not go to that well a little more? 
They did go to him once more. He got one rush for four yards, or I'm sorry, five yards. The do you get what I'm saying? Like, yes, there just course. isn't there just isn't a whole lot of consistency with Aaron Jones being out and now not or guys limited. Hopefully, he can be a f- more of a go this week, despite his sore hamstring. Ramping up, baby. It's just. It, it, it everything is difficult when your best player in offense is hurt, and it's, and honestly, like I'm not, I don't mean to cut across for you because I've been rambling. Like, go ahead. I, no, 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 it's fine. I will. That is a valid excuse. It is the emblematic of what the offense is right now. It goes beyond that, though. They just don't have an identity. They no, don't. And it's a, gr- it's a great way to put it. And and really, like, it, that is helped by having Aaron Jones play as much. But the fact that they are just searching for things as much as they are, whether that's personnel-based, whether that's throwing balls 20 yards or 25 yards down the field to guys that aren't finishing routes or balls that are underthrown or <laughs> telling a quarterback that doesn't have that in his arsenal to just keep throwing, keep throwing. It's just like... It, that is where it's really frustrating in terms of just they don't have these pet plays. The fact that not to keep hammering this home, but when we're talking about starts of the game and you're getting off to terrible starts, scoreless starts, your offense looks toothless. There isn't real imaginative plays that we used to see very often. And again, that's based on the guys that are executing those plays or lack thereof it contributes to where the offense is right now. And I think there was a quote from Tucker Craft about like today, I think it was actually from Paul Bridle. He spoke to like having players on tape that they can look at on the sideline and see what coverage they are, are, or their opponents are in to start the game and adjusting at that at halftime has helped them get back into games. And my course brain goes to, well, you think at this point everything is on tape? It's week eight. Yep. You know what I mean like yep. there's not a lot of secrets <laughs> to how you defend teams or what teams are going to look like. And obviously, again, this is it. it it's emboldened or, or heightened with how young this team is and how inexperienced it is because we're literally just talking about watching film and seeing. Right. Oh, that guy does that. This defense is doing this. Yeah. Stuff like that that we all take for granted and be like, you're professionals. You should know this. Blah, 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 blah. But what is really dismaying about that is that, yes, the players don't know better. I know who does know better. Allegedly. Allegedly. Yeah. That's where that. That's where it gets really frustrating for me is that, like, I cannot – I'm all about development. <laughs> if they tank out the rest of the season and just lose, go on this crazy slide down to who knows <laughs> – who the hell knows, I'm fine with that. I I just want to see I, – I, I don't – I cannot stomach another slow start where it's like, well, they're just going to make it that much harder on themselves to try to get back and then, you know, put get in a position where – they have to play for the game in the final drive and then just fall on their face. I'll get the puke bucket ready for everybody. <laughs> I'm ready. If you're not going to be able to stomach it, you might need it because I think they're yeah. going to start slow again. Um, context for the Tucker Craft. Um, oh, yes. Thank you. The Tucker Craft quote. Uh, Zach Cruz tweeted out. I think uh, Paul had just um, retweeted it. But regardless, this is it. Uh, sec- quote, second half, you've got maybe about 20 reps of their defense under your belt. You get the picture. You get to take advantage of what they're are, what they've already given you. Looks, scheme, safety rotation. You get a clear picture going in the second half about what they're doing. So that's why second half adjustments are always so pivotal in games. Maybe that's why we come out punching because we're familiar with their technique. Maybe we've already gotten the pressure and are, are familiar with it, and are familiar with it that time. It's always different. But you put it perfectly. Like the. The coordinator's jobs are to see these things and recognize these patterns and develop their defense and offenses around it. And so, like, I think what isn't talked about enough in our fandom and in our fan base is that 
the the transition from Adam Stenovich from offensive line coach to offensive coordinator has not been a success. Like no. both both units have gotten worse since his promotion. Yes. And it's how growth works in the NFL. Like you're put you climb the assistant ladder, you climb the the position coach ladder, and then you go to coordinator, you go to become a head coach. So it was a natural progression to make him a, a coordinator given the success that he had with his offensive line. However, it hasn't gone well. I think like the experiment has failed and it's unfortunate that you can't demote a guy like in like realistically in the NFL, right? Like I don't think I can ever think of a time where they demoted a coordinator to back to his original job. And it really is what should happen because he's a much better offensive line coaching as a coordinator. The offense has been stuck in the mud since the beginning of last year. And it's just, it's just tough. And I think that this year is more explainable. I will say this year is more explainable, but it's a lot of the same issues that were that were around last year. And the Aaron Rodgers of it all helped cover it up. Like he played not great well either last year, but he at least was able to take advantage of some of the big plays that they tried to take shots with, like in the same manner of at halftime of when Matt LaFleur talked to Jordan Love and said they, they need to take more shots downfield. That's mm. fine, but it's not fine with Jordan Love. It worked with Aaron Rodgers because he had the arm to do it. He may not have been accurate with it, but at least you had to respect the four-time MVP uh, Super Bowl champion to do it because he's Aaron Rodgers. And frankly, you know, the wide receiver core is not that all dis- or not discernibly different. If Jordan Love had someone like Alan Lazard, just that's just what we're, sa- that's what we're talking target. about. That's what we're talking about in the um the Discord, I think is either the Discord chat, Packers Pals, or our GSPN group chat with all the all the hosts. Spoiler alert, join GSPN the GSPN Discord, GSPN.info. It's a lot of fun. Great stuff in there. But the Packers don't have a, a a veteran receiver for Jordan Love to throw to, and I yeah. I recognize that the stereotype is is stupid, and I and I am in full recognition of this, and it's 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 dumb. But like the receiver, the the the, the white guy receiver that gets the label, Jim Rat, yeah. route runner. Like I'm talking Adam Thielen, like Cole Beasley, Wes all, Welker, Wes Welker, at Danny Amendola. All of these guys who you you make fun of for how they're described by the TV commentators, justifiably sneaky athletic, right? Sneaky athletic. All of those attributes that that they name for almost always short white wide receivers is exactly what not the white part doesn't need to be white, but is what Jordan Love needs, and he doesn't have it. And I think the perfect thing to look at is look at Bryce Young in Carolina. Bryce Young in Carolina is throwing to DJ Chark, was Terrace Marshall Jr. before he left, um, and Jonathan Mango, his rookie. But his leading receiver this year is Adam Thielen. Adam Thielen has 500 yards and uh, 49 receptions. 49 receptions, Jordan. <laughs> the ne- The next leading receiver on that team with catches is Terrace Marshall who requested a trade at 16. His next active one is Jonathan Mingo at 15. The next one after that is Miles Sanders, their freaking running back that, that this is what I'm getting at. Bryce young leader of the Owen seven Owen six Carolina Panthers. Yeah. Having a rough year has six touchdowns to four interceptions that has taken 16 snacks. Uh, sacks averaging less than 200 yards per game and has played poorly enough to where um, Andy Dalton has 58 passing attempts. He's having a rough rookie year. Yes. And who is his primary target? His only veteran wide receiver. And that's where all the production is coming from. Adam Thielen has four touchdowns. Like that's it. This is this is what I'm getting at. We we haven't really talked about roster construction enough this discourse the entire season. 
But Brian Gutekunst severely misstepped in not giving Jordan Love a veteran wide receiver. Severely misstepped. Whether it was paying Alan Lazard a contract that he wanted, whether he wanted to come back or not, given that we, we knew kind of Aaron Rodgers was going to New York, going to New York, yeah. going out and getting anybody. Like they could have signed DeAndre Hopkins. He was there. They could have traded for him if they really wanted him. Like, who knows what a DeAndre Hopkins does for this team? But golly, a veteran receiver that you know you can count on to catch a ball, I think has to do wonders, right? And so it it really speaks to how poorly this offseason was managed from a roster construction standpoint and how they tried to justify it as, hey, when you're a young team, you got to make sure that you play your young guys to understand where you're at with some of these players' development. But at that point, they cut the team's nose off despite their face. They they sacrificed... The quarterback. Exactly. They sacrificed Jordan Love's development to see the rest of the offense develop. And that isn't how it should have worked. It should have been in, inhibit Christian Watson or Romeo Dobbs or Jaden Reeds or Samari Turi's development in order to see how well Jordan Love can develop. And it just, it just didn't happen. It clearly, and it's not happening. No. And I, 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 not to be this guy, but there were restrictions in terms of what the, the Packers could do in terms of limited cap space. But <sighs> I mean, st- I, I don't, I me don't, wrong, but DeAndre Hopkins did a, did he get a big contract from Tennessee? I don't he, think it was a lot. He did get the most that was offered at that time, but that was also, I believe, I mean, thirteen million dollars. That's a lot of money, but he, it's his, a lot of money post June first cut because that was yeah. what was surprising about him moving on. But from even Arizona. then, they could have traded for him. The, yes. He didn't get, he didn't get cut until May thirtieth. No, even before. Be- Oh, I thought it was after June first. Nope, he didn't get released by Arizona May thirtieth. They they were trying to wow. trade for him. They gave him permission yes, that's to, right. to seek to seek a trade. Yeah, and so like it just, I don't know. I think you could have gotten him for like a fifth, dude. Clearly, because the if they could have gotten a fifth for him, I guess he's on the trade block again. By the way, right? That's what I'm saying. If they could have gotten a fifth for him or offered, they would have gotten it. The Cardinals wouldn't have traded him for nothing if they or yeah. cut him for nothing They're if they could have got a pick yeah. for him. And so it's just like there it's, it's the a point it's one of the more frustrating missteps of this offseason so far. Yeah, because it affects everything. And I think I think they thought that Aaron Jones was gonna be enough of that. AJ Dillon to the lesser extent. Well, I don't know. <laughs> but the fact that it wasn't even addressed at all and that they're going with such a young offense and set of pass catchers i mean it has not done love favors to that much is clear no absolutely not and to to, to belabor this point we've kind of got away from the, the vikings and packers of it all but i think we're touching on some important things that matter as to why this team may not have success on sunday <laughs> to yeah tie back into it but like for for goody to think that like, yes, Aaron Jones is the veteran back and receiver that we can rely on for help the Jordan Love's development. That's malpractice, frankly. Like, Aaron Jones is not a route running receiver. He's not running post routes and 10-yard digs on routes. He's not. He's a wheel route yeah. guy and a guy over the middle. Like, he's not a receiver. He's a freaking running back. And so, I think I'm starting to come around on the people who are like calling for Goody to be fired. I'm not there yet because I think this is a very tough season for a lot of fans to to swallow, considering we haven't been in this spot in quite some time. But between this roster construction, the roster construction leading to the poor development of Jordan Love, the track record of the the picks recently it's it's building up it's building up and depending on how the rest of the season goes i don't know if i want them picking that pick early 
That is the big question, is that if it, it continues, our, we'll be talking plenty about prospects, that, that much as we've gotten to that point, but we will have a lot of conversations about the brain trust in place mm-hmm. in terms of picking the right guys and developing in the right guys because <laughs> there's not a lot of offense talent that we could really say after Aaron Jones – in 2017, Packers have hit on these guys. I think the other guy that I would probably mention is MVS, and he's on Kansas City. Yeah. I mean, even then, like, he had his own problems, drops. Oh, of course, yes. Wasn't exactly, like, he was yeah. Christian Watson light, essentially. Yeah. They just, they just didn't have a, they didn't spend a second round draft pick on him. He was, like, third or fourth round. Yeah. Um, fifth round, actually, now that I'm looking at it. But yeah, I'm going to go back to it now that you mentioned it. Um, I'm trying to find it now. So in 2017, they drafted both um, Aaron Jones and Jamal Williams, two offensive players that that worked out quite well. Since then, on offense, they've drafted uh, Jamon Moore, Marquez Valdez Scanley, uh, Equinemius St. Brown. This is a specialist, by the way. Just I'll, I'll say just receivers and tight ends. Yeah. Um, Jay Sternberger. Mm. Uh, no receiver drafted in 2019, which is wonderful. Um, AJ Dillon, Josiah DeGuara, yeah. no wide receiver drafted in 2020. Uh, Amari Rodgers in 2021, Christian Watson in 2022, along with Romer Dobbs, uh, and Samari Toure. And then obviously this year, Jaden Reed, Tucker Craft, and Luke Westgrave, as well as I apologize, um, Dante Van Wicks and Grant DeBose, and then they brought in Malik Heath. And here, here, here's the problem with it, as you mentioned. None of these guys, besides Christian Watson, were pre-third round. They're just not investing in before this year. My apologies. Yeah. None of these guys were the top-end talent that they needed them to be. Like, I know, and... I, I yell at people too with this when it comes to revisionist ideas of um, like draft order, like re- redrafting things. You know what I mean? Yes. Yeah. And but they take Rashawn Gary this in in 2019 at at pick 12 for all intents and purposes a good pick. He's he's, he's worked out. He's a, a crucial part of this team um, of this team right now. They take Donald Savage at 21, nine picks later. And this isn't even like a strong class of receivers. But if you just like, I don't, I, it's always tough to ask someone to reach for a guy. But between Savage and uh, Elton Jenkins at 44, they missed on Marquise Brown, Hollywood Brown, for all intents and purposes, a good wide receiver, Nikhil Harry. Debo Samuel or three wide receivers taken between those things. Imagine Debo Samuel on this team. And it's it's tough to ask them to do that because they had Tay and they had like pieces in place, right? Like they had they were competing. They were picking they yeah. were they were well, I guess mm, they weren't competing. This was the 2018 this is this is Matt LaFleur's this is first draft. Them, yeah, this is them trying to get back into it. But then you look at the guys they drafted between that were that were drafted between um, Elton Jenkins, and I'm not saying Elton Jenkins is a bad pick. It's a good pick. But then, and again, we are so far off, and I apologize. Like, getting away from the preview at all. It's kind of turned into something more of a rant. And I'm again, I apologize, but this is, I think, good things to look at in context of where we're at as a team. Between Elton Jenkins and Jay Sternberger in the third, the wide receivers that were drafted were AJ Brown, <laughs> McCole Car- Hardman, um, JJ Arcia Arcega Whiteside, not a is fine. Oh, yeah. Harris Campbell, who isn't bad. He was good in um Indianapolis. Indianapolis hasn't really shown much this year from his time in um New York New York Giants. Andy Isabella, whatever. Um last pick of the second round, DK Metcalf. And then oh, yeah, Deontay Johnson, who is a who is ridiculous. Jalen Hurd, and then Jay Sternberger. The pick, and this has been this has been litigated over a lot of times in Packers Twitter sphere. 
the pick directly after Chase Sternberger is Terry McLaurin. Mm. And so it's a failure on Brian Gutenkunst's part to not invest in receivers during the Devontae wide receiver one era. It just yeah. is. Because I think they got way too into it of trying to win right now, which you cannot blame him for trying to do. They had Aaron Rodgers. You have to maximize the rest of his career. But at the same time, you have to look beyond Devonta Adams in the death chart. They didn't have anybody. No. They didn't have anybody. And their so be- their second best wide receiver after that would have been Lazard, who they p- poached off the Pratt squad. Right. Which it's, they have a knack of doing that, but like that shouldn't be your, your way point. Of doing it, it shouldn't be. Yeah, you fired all, fired nine bullets, and you missed every missed every target. single one. Yeah, that's... they haven't hit on any offensive wide receiver or offensive playmakers since Aaron Jones, and it yeah. shows. Yes, Jordan Love included. At so this far. point, yeah, yeah, I had an argument with my dad uh, on the <laughs> night. He goes, I think Jordan Love sucks. Like, I don't think he does, but we're we're headed towards that way. And as I told him, he goes, he says, I'll put in Sean Clifford. I was like, I don't know if we're there yet. No. We're not putting Sean Clifford in there that is, Yeah, I've seen a lot. Of, what, for what? I don't understand why. So we can see another quarterback not play well. Not play well. Right. I think. <laughs> no, I'm not going to get that. All right. Players, so I, do you have anything else on the Vikings of it all? We should touch on that before we get into predictions and everything like that. No, I'll get into it with my player. Okay. I already have, I already have my Viking in mind. Perfect. But... So I have talked for the last 15 minutes. I will let you um, do this. And for you pod listeners, this is going to be a, a brief interruption to your regular listening hours. But welcome to the YouTube everybody we're doing a new thing we're trying to put some uh little shorter clips out there so this is my intro to this and this won't happen every time we have these shorter videos, shorter videos on youtube but we figure we give you a little snippet of the best of pod if you're watching this go listen to the pod on spotify apple podcast anywhere you find your pods so we'd appreciate it jordan your players to watch for sunday's matchup against the minnesota vikings going vikings first okay Daniil Hunter, the NFL sack leader, nine. Um, Packers have had a lot of problems, whether it has been Max Crosby, Aiden Hutchinson, um, probably missing someone else from Falcons game, maybe, or Saints game, I can't remember. But when it comes to premier pass rushers across the NFL, and within their own division. Uh, Packers have really struggled. Daniel Hunter, we talked a lot about the blitzing measures that the <laughs> that the uh, Vikings go. Um, and having a guy like Daniel Hunter, who there was a lot of t- off-season turbulence with him. He wanted out, wanted to trade. They eventually settled on, I believe, a contract extension or something to basically keep him in, in Minnesota. And he's arguably playing the best football of his career. Um, He's not as versatile as like Max Crosby, who just lined up everywhere on the cross the line. But I think all eyes will be on Rashid Walker to (laughs) block him, keep him out of Jordan Love's hair, that kind of thing. And that's a tall task when a guy, you know, going into this game has nine sacks through seven games. Um, Yeah, just think it's very simple. If you want to keep clean pockets, if you want Jordan Love to make, <laughs> I guess, hope to make quick throws, keep the guy that's going to be in, you know, looking to get in his face and take him down um, and keep him out of there. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's pretty, pretty obvious. Like I shouldn't say obvious as to get rid of all of your analysis and whatnot. But yeah, he's been absolutely fantastic this year. Um, in total, like going across, uh, the the weeks he has he had three pressures against Tampa Bay, uh, six against that stout Philly line, wow. uh, three against the Chargers, one against the against Carolina, and then four four and six against the Chiefs, the Bears, and the Niners. Like he's just getting these pressures 
all the time and he's doing what Rashawn Gary wasn't and that's getting home. And I'm not trying to like rag on Rashawn Gary like I have been the entire pod. But my point being is that like if we want to see a real impact from Rashawn Gary, what Daniel Hunter is doing is is that. Yeah. Oh, so yeah. um, I am surprised that you didn't take. uh Take this Viking for it for your player to watch. I'm going with Jordan Addison. Uh, I don't think they could have asked for more from Jordan Addison to replace Justin Jefferson when he went down. Um, looking at his stats quick from this season, he has uh, 400 yards on 30 catches and six touchdowns. Uh, looks like since I forget what week Justin Jefferson went down, but he had in his last three games against Kansas City, Chicago, and the Niners, he has six, three, and seven catches for 64, 28, and 123 yards. 123 yards passing or receiving against that that Niners defense, which is damn good, frankly. Yeah. He's been a really good second and third option when Justin Jefferson was healthy as a, as a, as a three, and now as a two that he's not, and TJ Hawkinson's probably the number one. But even through the first three weeks of the season, 61, 72, and 52 yards receiving. Like he's been playing really well. And I think what is honestly a little hilarious of it all is I remember when we did like draft recap of or like draft analysis of who we wanted in, in the um in the draft picking at 13 and then in the second round. A lot of people were like, mm. I'm not really sure Jordan Addison is going to be good yeah. or if he's going to make it out of the first or if he's going to be there in the first round or I'm sorry, if you should be drafted in the first round was my point. And I think he's having the best rookie season, no matter like of the rookies so far. JSN has been impactful when it comes to uh, the, the Seahawks now that DK Metcalf is is uh hurt he's been doing a little better but jsn was the first guy off the board for as a receiver at 20 uh quentin johnson at 22 um i'm sorry at 21 <laughs> has has had an opportunity with mike williams going down he hasn't produced zay flowers no. is, is getting a lot of yards hasn't been um hasn't had a lot of uh touchdowns i think he only has one but for context zay flowers has 39 catches for 442 yards on touchdown. Jordan Addison has 29 catches for 400 yards and six touchdowns. Like they're they're pretty even so far. And I think the touchdowns kind of pushes him over the edge versus the uh the receptions gain and the the yards uh advantage he has. But then trying to look at a couple more Jonathan Mingo for the Panthers we mentioned earlier. Yep. Fine, not not Jordan Addison. And then before we go way down into the doldrums, like Jaden Reed and a couple others, uh, Rasheed Rice is having a good season for the the Chiefs, but I think I turn more of that to, to Patrick Mahomes and Rasheed, Rasheed Rice. So Jordan Addison is is the player to watch for on the Vikings side of the ball on Sunday because if whoever they stick on him, whether it's Carrington Valentine or Corey Valentine or Azul or in, or maybe Jair if he ends up playing. Whoever is covering Jordan Addison is going to have their work cut out for him. And I think Joe Barry has to come prepared to treat Jordan Addison like they treated Justin Jefferson in the second Vikings game last year. Otherwise, he'll he'll torch most of the sec- the secondary, which is depleted if Jair is out. So yeah, Jordan Addison is my my Viking to watch for sure. Only Tyreek Hill has more touchdowns than him. Receiving touchdowns. And Right, and Tyreek's having a monster year. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Just ridiculous. Right. Who's your packer, buddy? Um, it's getting harder just because they suck. Yeah, it's um, not, not going well. You know, I'm going to go, I'm going to basically do the same thing. Rashawn Gary. That makes sense. He, it, it's, you know, we talked a lot about him trying to get home and stuff like that. But as much as we were really bullish about the depth that the, the Packers had on the edge, it's really been the Rashawn Gary show. And again, 
He's played half of the defensive snaps pretty much at this point. Yeah. Um, so for him to really generate pressures, ratchet it up, everything like that, get home, possibly, you know, get Kirk Cousins on the ground and maybe force turnovers that way too. Um, Rashawn Gary is probably the best bet to do that. The snap count is going up week by week. Um, yeah, just <laughs> keep doing what you're doing, but just a little, like 10% more. That's what I would say to Rashawn Gary. <laughs> yeah. And like, I wouldn't, even, I wouldn't even be sad if he did more than 10% more. Frankly, yeah, fifteen, whatever it is, we'll, give a hundred percent more. Give it a hundred. Yeah, exactly. You're doing. You need to give a hundred and ten percent, a hundred and ten percent. We'll I take it. Yeah, regardless, we're we're joking around. Um, <laughs> my Packer, and I, I I defaulted to you. Usually, we go one one, like one two one for picking. I I can't think of one like of, of like someone that really stands out, which means I'm going to default to Jordan Love. Because, like, he's the quarterback. We talked about ad nauseum about what he needs to do on this pod and how he needs to quit making similar mistakes, but looking down his receivers, learn to to throw the ball away, hit the guys who are open, frankly, is the biggest thing. And there's there's points to be scored against this um against this Vikings team. They don't get I don't think they've given up um they only get one 30 point game this, this year and it's against the, the Eagles week two in Philadelphia. So again, I also don't think they face that many high powered offenses. They let up 27 of the chiefs, which makes sense, but uh, 20, 28, 21, 27, 19, 22, like there's points to be scored there. And I think the biggest thing is just a fast start. And that's a Matt LaFleur problem too. the play, the play, uh, calls and the the script to start the game need to be on point. But if I could see a home crowd really into it to to cheer on the Packers and be supportive of what they're they're going for, which is a win and is development, then maybe that helps. Maybe that helps a a young team get a little win in their sails to the point where it all just feels like football again and not. Like it's work, you know what I mean? Yeah, like, yeah, th- to get on the human side of it all, I think they're all reeling on the the back of this three game slide and knowing that they've lost to two pretty bad teams. But it's it's tough when you're a young team like this. We talked about it's hard to win. You got to find out ways to win. They haven't, but against a division rival who is on a winning streak and at home for the first time in a month, I think Jordan Love has an opportunity to be a leader of this offense to then get these guys going, try and find guys in rhythm and stride and hit, hit your target. And if he does that, they might have a chance to win on Sunday. And even if they don't, it at least pick them up if they're playing close rather than getting blown out against the lions or making stupid mistakes that they had been in the last two weeks against the, the Raiders and the Broncos. Score predictions. Are you ready? I might break my streak. Unfortunately, your, your streak of picking Packers wins. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. For, for you people watching the YouTube, this little new short clip we got going on. I've picked the Packers to win repeatedly since week one. I've been a believer that they should be winning these games. And I've been proven wrong. in position to and they've been in position to. I've been pick, predicting large offensive outputs, though, which hasn't happened. <laughs> no <laughs> excuse me but I am going to unfortunately pick the Vikings to win not that it brings me any happiness but I'll say 28 to 16 which is a stark contrast to what I've written in the past and maybe they'll win this week despite me Vikings, 31. Packers, 16. So you haven't scored. And, and basically, Price is writing you. Yeah. <laughs> See how you are. Um, all right, folks. That does it for us. Um, feel free to find all of our podcasts at gspn.info. You can find All Thanks Packers with us, Talk of the Tundra. 
um, at Packers GSPN is our Twitter handle. You can see our Twitter handles on the screen. Um, but for you pod listeners, obviously at New Mecca's known at Jordan Tresky. Uh, you can go check out all things Brewers at Cruising for a Bruising as Adam and Andrew recap the Brewers uh, offseason here in the next couple of weeks. Or I'm sorry, recap the Brewers season in the next couple of weeks and then talk about some offseason moves coming up. Craig Council, Corbin Burns, Willie Damas, all that good and happy stuff. And then if you're listening to this uh, in the morning, like you should be as a loyal listener, Bucks play tonight. Damon Giannis, Ooh. freaky time, begins against the 76ers tonight as the, the new look Bucks get started. So I know Jordan and Adam are going to cover on one and six, and Tanya Rohan are going to cover it on Eurostep. And all four of them did a three hour pod on uh, the Bucks predictions for the year, in which case, uh, in the middle of it was dropped about the Giannis extension. So that was mm-hmm. a fun video to react to or watch and listen to as the the boys reacted to it live. So go check out all of those on your podcast platform of choice. Or if you're watching on the YouTube, you can go click over to the video that's in our on our profile now. So all right, everybody, that was one of the longer previews we've had at an hour and 36 minutes. So regardless of it all, we appreciate your listenership and uh Thank you for listening. And Jordan, thank you. Thank you.